Welcome to Haynes History Tidbit number 22, Halibut Fishing and Hooks. I'm Helen Alton, the director of the Haynes Sheldon Museum, and um, today we are going to be talking about halibut fishing and hooks. And this is a topic that has fascinated me. Halibut as a fish are an interesting species, and uh, how they are caught is also extremely fascinating. To outsiders, Alaska is often heralded for our seafood, in particular salmon, crab, king crab, and halibut. The delicious Pacific halibut is a delicacy enjoyed by both visitors and locals. While contemporary halibut fishing is primarily commercial or associated with tourism, such as halibut fishing charters, Today's history tidbit will focus on early subsistence fishing and specifically a historical and ingenious local technology, the Clinket halibut hook. To start off, I'd like to share some general facts about the halibut. The scientific name for the Pacific halibut is Hippoglossus stenolepis. The term halibut comes from Middle English and it, it was halibut or halibut, meaning the flatfish to be eaten on holy days. The clinket term for halibut is chattel. Halibut are a type of flounder or flatfish. They are the largest of all the flatfish and can reach gigantic proportions in local waters, sometimes reaching six feet in length and weighing over 400 pounds. The ideal size for eating is about 30 to 50 pounds. And here um, in the picture are four soldiers with a halibut, showing an, a very large halibut. A halibut that was too large could sink a canoe or severely injure the fishermen. To ensure a manageable size catch, Clinket fishermen devised a special halibut hook which would only be taken by a 30 to 50 pound fish. Moreover, this medium range halibut was considered superior for drying. So this is what the clinket halibut hook looks like. The clinket wooden halibut hook is designed in a sideways V shape, the upper arm made from a lighter, buoyant wood such as yellow cedar, while the lower arm is made from a heavier wood which anchors it in the proper orientation in the water. The heavier wood lower arm is often carved with various designs or spirit figures to honor the halibut. So this is the heavier side. These designs, often heraldic or associated with the shaman, include symbolic designs like skeletons, devilfish, and others. And some of them can be quite complex. In many museums, including ours, halibut hooks are often displayed in a way that the carving is clearly visible. However, this often means displaying the hook contrary to its proper orientation in the water. So the typical display is with the carving up, but the actual orientation in the water is with the carving down. Hooks were, and still are, baited with fish and lowered with a line. Traditionally, this line could be made of red cedar fiber, braided sinew, or even a strong stem of bull kelp. Stone sinkers carried the line to the bottom and wooden floats carved in animal forms alerted the fishermen to a bite. So this is the float and the line. And this is an additional floater to help um, keep the, the metal this side up and it's only used when there's a metal hook. The entire assembly was kept afloat with inflated bladders, allowing the fishermen to set several lines at once. Once a halibut was caught on the hook, the neck of the buoy would rise out of the water and stand vertically, indicating the catch. Halibut could then be brought up towards a canoe where it was clubbed to prevent its thrashing from sinking the boat. So in the figure on the left is an image from a former uh, Sheldon Museum display demonstrating this setup. At the top is a club for hitting the halibut. Um, next is a buoy, and this would go vertical when, uh, when the fish has been caught. And it, um, one halibut buoy we've seen has a hand at the top, so it sort of raises its hand when it, the fish is caught. Um, 
And then there's, um, it's attached with a corded line to the halibut hook. And again, you'll notice that the hook is displayed almost upside down in order to show off the carving. Here on the right is from Hillary Stewart's book, Indian Fishing, a diagram demonstrating the full setup for a baited halibut hook. So here's the correct orientation of the fish, of the hook, um, with the heavier wood down below, and then the rock holding it to the sinker. So how does the hook actually catch these giant fish? The V-shaped design accommodates the flat shape of the fish and responds to halibut's method of eating, which is sucking in food like a vacuum cleaner. Bait, such as octopus, squid, or herring, is tied to the lighter upper arm, which also has the sharp angled barb to catch the halibut. Once the properly sized halibut takes the bait, the underside of their mouth slides between the pointed barb and the lower arm of the hook. When they are unable to swallow the bait, the halibut expels the hook with the same force that they sucked it in. However, this causes the angled bait to catch on their mouth. Because of the V-shape, the halibut cannot swim forward to dislodge the hook, and any attempts to withdraw only secure the barb more firmly. This process is demonstrated in these figures, which come from Hillary Stewart's book. The size of the hook is calibrated to only catch a certain size of halibut. Fish smaller than 30 pounds can reach the bait, but their mouths are not deep enough to get caught on the barb of the hook. Fish larger than 50 pounds can get the bait, but the underside of their mouth is too large to fit between the barb and the lower arm, so they too are not caught. So a larger foot fish, the whole mouth, would, it would encapsulate the whole hook, and so there'd be no barb. And a smaller fish, it would not be able to get, it just would be a little bit here, it would not be able to get in. Recently, Sea Alaska Heritage in Juneau created a halibut-related curriculum for middle school students as part of their annual Opening the Box summer program for Alaska Native students. This program teaches math concepts through Native arts practices such as basketry, weaving, and carving. Among other key concepts in the halibut hook curriculum, students learn how to calibrate hook size for corresponding halibut size. While their deadline for the virtual Opening the Box program this summer has passed, we've included a link to the halibut-related curriculum description and associated videos under the educational resources on our website. It's interesting for all ages. Now I'd like to give you a closer look at two of the halibut hooks in our museum collection and the differences between them. This first halibut hook was donated to the museum in 2017. It is currently on display in our main gallery. Notice the carved design and the bone hook. While we do not have an exact date for this object, this is an older style hook that uses a traditional barb made out of bone. And it's also, this is split spruce root that wraps it. This is a more modern uh, line coming out. Once iron became available to the region, um, such as nails or scrap metal such as nails could be used in place of the bone barb. This hook from the collection features a metal hook. Because metal is heavier than the bone, this style barb could interfere with equilibrium of the hook. To counteract this effect, many metal barbed halibut hooks would also have an additional wooden float, which is seen here. Notice the scratch marks and wear on the upper arm showing um, wear from many halibut mouths. This is pretty worn down here. And this hook would have been used quite a bit. This is an example of a halibut buoy. A buoy. Um, the, when the halibut would bite, the neck of the buoy, which is right here, would rise up vertically in the water. It's unclear if this particular buoy was ever used, um, however, it's a good model of the style. Halibut buoys are often shaped like birds, such as swans or geese. The shape, um, this long, thin shape kind of lends itself to it. However, each is unique, uh, just like the hooks, and some people had fun with these, and, and some of them were quite, quite unique. I didn't. Well, we have several halibut hooks in the collections. All of our historic photos of halibut fishing pertain to Fort Soldiers, 
and other non-native fishermen. Halibut fishing was a common pastime for Fort Seward soldiers and their families. In this photo, taken in 1915, a group of soldiers hoists a pole with two halibut, one extremely large and a medium-sized halibut hanging from the middle of it. A small boy stands to the left of the fish. A man in a cooking apron stands to the right in the photograph with his right arm extended toward the fish. You'll notice this, that this oversized halibut is not in the ideal 30 to 50 pound range caught with traditional halibut hooks. And this is because fort soldiers used metal lures, such as this lure pictured below. This lure was made in 1915 by Harry McMahon. At left, a soldier from Fort Seward baits a slew of halibut gear in the 1920s. This image, also from the 1920s, shows two soldiers standing under the porch of a rustic cabin. They have several strings with many smaller chicken halibut and one larger halibut, and some of these would not be legal catch today. The final image I'd like to share is a postcard showing Paul Carlock and Carl Tagg posing on the dock at Fort Seward with a large halibut they've caught, as well as three small children, two of whom are identified as Frank Young Jr. and Joyce Comstock. Thanks for listening to, to today's History Tidbit on, his, on halibut fishing and hooks. Associated educational resources are posted on our website, including that curriculum from um, Sea Alaska Heritage. And finally, as a reminder, there are only two weeks left to see the temporary exhibit, Alaska Suffrage Star, which is on display by appointment in our main gallery. Call 766-2366 or visit our website at sheldonmuseum.org to make an appointment. This exhibit closes next Friday, June 26th. Have a good rest of your week, and I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this week's history tidbit.